Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Utility Sports, and I'm really excited for the start of the NBA season. We keep inching closer and closer, and the NBA season is really the big time here on the channel, so make sure you guys are subscribed for more content here on the channel, and also leave a like on today's video if you do enjoy. And of course, like it says in the thumbnail and on the title, we are going through the Western Conference here with my standings prediction, looking at all 15 teams in the West, where I project them to finish, and this will probably be a highly disputed video by you because you're probably not going to agree with all 15 of my seedings. So let me know in the comment section exactly how you think the West is going to play out this year. Of course, there's room for disagreement. Just understand that if I see it a little bit differently than you, it doesn't mean necessarily you're wrong or I'm wrong, but we just have different expectations and there's a wide range of possibilities throughout the season. But looking at 15 here, I think there's only a few teams that we could really consider being the worst team in the Western Conference this year. And I think my favorite to put here at that 15 spot is the Utah Jazz. Not necessarily that their talent is equivalent to that 15 seed, but one issue that they're going to have is one, they're really young, and two, they have a lot of moving pieces. Traded Rudy Gobert, traded Boyan Bogdanovich, traded Donovan Mitchell, traded Patrick Beverly out. He didn't even play a game for that franchise. When you look at Utah as well, Brand new coach in Will Hardy, which was, I think, a good hire. They gave him a long-term deal. So it's something that they're planning on building. But this first year is going to be rough. This is the tank for Victor Wembanyama year. And I think the Utah Jazz are going to be right in the thick of it. Lori Markkinen, good addition. Probably could see him getting traded at some point this year. Colin Sexton, I think a pretty good addition. But one thing we've seen from Colin Sexton, if he's your best player, you're probably not winning a lot of games. We saw that with Cleveland out in the East for quite a while. And now I don't think that's going to be any different here for Utah in the West. At 14, this is where we get into a couple of other teams that I think we could really consider. And this one's going to be widely disputed, I think, but I'm going with the Houston Rockets. Yes, I think this team is better than last year, but I don't necessarily think that that means it's going to be a big swing in terms of where they sit in the standings. And a big reason for that is they're still really young. They're going to rely on a player who's not a point guard playing point guard in Kevin Porter Jr. Yes, he got better at it throughout the year, but I don't think he's going to be a great point guard this season by any means. I think Jalen Green does take a massive step forward in terms of his production and his efficiency, which is going to be really good for this team. I think they're a pretty good 14 seed. Uh, obviously, that sounds a little counterintuitive, but the West is tough. You know, a lot of the attention's gone to the East and rightfully so. But the West hasn't really gotten any easier, especially with teams like the Nuggets and Clippers coming back healthy this year. The Lakers hopefully probably not going to be as bad as they were last year. The West isn't a cakewalk either. So realistically, the Rockets have 14. They're not as bad as they were last year, but again, they're going to be really reliant on a lot of young players. Jabari Smith Jr. is going to be a starter for them. Tar Eason's going to be one of the top seven guys in their rotation. I think this year is another development year for them. Getting Boban Marjanovic, I think, is a really good culture thing for that locker room. And I do like the direction they're heading. I really do. I thought they had one of the best drafts in the entire NBA this past draft. But it doesn't necessarily mean it translates to wins immediately. Down the road, I definitely think it will. I love the future of this team. But the current, the present, not quite as strong. Moving into number 13 now. When we look here, I think there's a, probably a couple teams that we could consider again. The two teams I really like for this spot. San Antonio and Oklahoma City. Those were the two teams I would consider here. San Antonio, of course, made the play in last year, but traded their best player, DeJounte Murray. And Oklahoma City was a team kind of hovering right around the spot last year, drafted Chad Holmgren. Well, he's out for the entire year. So you could really make a good argument for either. OKC will start their tank fest right around February, like they always do. And San Antonio has Greg Popovich, who always seems to win more games than he should, which is why I have them above Houston here. But I am ultimately landing with San Antonio at 13th. I think the loss of DeJounte Murray is really big. Now, I think Devin Vassell, Keldon Johnson, those two guys specifically for San Antonio are going to take big steps forward. But I also wouldn't be shocked this year if San Antonio trades Jakob Pertl away, which again would really hurt that team in terms of its production and ability to win right now. San Antonio landing at 13th. I could see them 12. I could see them 14, but I really like that sweet spot there right in the middle at 13. And like I alluded to here, Oklahoma City to 12. This team, had Chet Holmgren been healthy, I think would have been a sleeper to make the play-in. Probably would have still not opted for them to be a play-in team, but they would have been right in the race for that, I think. But now at this point, I just don't really love where they're at, just looking at their front court. You know, Derek Favors, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, Alexei Pokashevsky, if you consider him a big, he plays more like a small forward to me. So they're not going to rebound the ball very well. 
And that's really, you know, a tough way to win in the league if you're not rebounding. So Oklahoma City at 12, I feel like that's a really safe bet. I love Shea Gilgis Alexander. He's the reason I put them above Utah, Houston, and San Antonio here. But ultimately, they'll shut him down with some type of quote-unquote ankle injury toward the deadline. Obviously, he won't actually be injured. Neither will Josh Giddy, but I'm sure the two of them will not play in March or April because that's been the OKC trend the last couple of years. Now, the 11 seed. This is really the toughest spot in the entire video because you look at the teams left on the screen. The Lakers, Mavericks, Nuggets, Warriors, Clippers, Wolves, Pelicans, Suns, Blazers, Kings, Grizzlies are all legitimately pretty good teams. And some of these teams are really, really great. For me, the 11 spot, like I said, is the hardest place to pick. And you guys, if you've been watching the channel, you kind of figured this was coming. I'm putting Sacramento in the 11 spot. I'm just not a believer in the Kings. Yes, DeMontis Sabonis was a really good addition for them on paper. You like his offensive fit next to De'Aaron Fox. They had 115 points per 100 possessions, which is an elite offense when those two players were on the floor together. The only downfall, though, they gave up 117 points per 100 possessions when those two were on the floor as well. The offense does not outweigh the defense. And for these other teams, what is a really strong West, I think the Kings are the team that just finds themselves barely on the outside looking in. Now, if one of these teams has a disastrous injury, which is very possible, the Kings could definitely make the play. And if they do, it's a really successful season for them. But if they miss and DeMontis Sabonis kind of staring at free agency, that Tyrese Halliburton trade could look even uglier than it already does. Now at number 10, we're looking at the last team to make the play-in, and there's some good options here for that as well. You know, a lot of people are going to say, hey, the Mavericks took a step back. They lost Jalen Brunson this year. Pelicans, you know, they were an eight seed last year as they made the playoffs through the play-in. Are they there? Could the Portland Trailblazers be there? All of those are pretty good arguments, and I am going to opt for Portland just at this spot because I think Portland, Damian Lillard coming off of an injury, Last year, they really struggled to build that defensive identity. Now, a big part of that was their team just wasn't healthy. Yusuf Nurkic missed most of the season. Damian Lillard missed most of the season. Uh, and quite frankly, that team just wasn't who they were supposed to be when it comes to the health factor on that roster. They just weren't healthy. But I'm looking here for a, an opportunity for Chauncey Billups to build this team. And if he does it the way that I think he can, he's going to be better than the Kings. But it's still an uphill battle. You have two small guards in the backcourt, Damian Lillard, who's aging a little bit, and Anthony Simons, who he's a good young guard, but he's a young guard who is a little undersized. So how is he going to play the two? I think Gary Payton the second was a really good get for them. The Blazers, again, this is really tough. I think the Blazers in most years could maybe be a six or seven seed. This year I have them at the 10 because it's just a really tough conference to play in right now. And I think the Lakers here are the ninth best team in the West. This might raise some eyebrows as well. Yes, they have LeBron. Yes, they have Anthony Davis. I like the Pat Bev edition as well for them. That's why they are ranked above Portland and Sacramento here. Because I think Patrick Beverly brings a different mental and a different attitude to that team that they really badly need. An attitude of, hey, we're the underdogs. We got to go step up. Whereas everyone else on that team kind of has like the, oh, I'm a superstar mentality there. I think Patrick Beverly is going to be very helpful for them. But at the end of the day, Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, plus a center, plus LeBron James, plus Patrick Beverly, that's just not that good of a starting five. If they're able to find a way to make a trade for Miles Turner and Buddy Heald, that completely shifts my mindset here. But ultimately, the Lakers, to me, nine seed. Could see them maybe playing up to a seven or eight seed, but I think playing is really what they're destined for. Moving into the eighth seed now, and again, it just does not get easier. And I'm going to go with a little bit of a hot take here. We are dragging the New Orleans Pelicans up to number eight. And I know some people are going to say, whoa, why are you doing that with New Orleans? They were just the team last year that represented the eighth seed in the playoffs. Zion should be healthy this year and play a lot of games. Why aren't they just instantly better? Part of the reason they're not going to be instantly better is you look at the fit. CJ McCollum really blossomed because he was playing the point guard position with the ball in his hands. And Brandon Ingram had the ball in his hands a ton. For Zion to be effective, what we've seen so far in his career is he plays with the basketball. Now, he's got a skill set that he doesn't need it. And he does a lot of great things when he doesn't have it. But at his best, when he's scoring 27 points a game, it's because he has the ball in his hands. So if he has it, CJ won't have it. Brandon Ingram won't have it. And it kind of is a little counterintuitive throughout that roster, I think. They're still good. Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, I love those two guys as young wings. I really like the outlook of this team. 
But again, really tough West right now. I just think that they're a little bit more limited in terms of what their offense and their defensive capabilities look like, especially protecting the rim with Jonas Valanciunas as their center. You know, I'm just not sold on it quite yet at this point, but I think they're a very good team again. This is not your normal year. Pelicans, their roster right now, probably historically look at that as a five seed. Right now I have it as an eight seed just because of how strong the NBA is right now. I feel like there's a ton of parity and the Pelicans are a perfect example of that here, getting the eight seed recognition. Now at number seven, we have a bevy of teams here as well. You have the Mavericks who, yes, they lost Jalen Brunson. You have the Denver Nuggets who lost their president, made some interesting moves, but I think that you could argue, hey, Jamal Murray's coming back. Hopefully MPJ can play this year. They should be better, right? The Warriors just won the NBA Finals. Probably shouldn't look at them as a seven seed. Clippers really talented as well. Probably not a seven. Timberwolves, I think, are definitely better than a seven seed. The Phoenix Suns and the Memphis Grizzlies. And it's really difficult to find a seven seed. We're looking at the last team that's going to be in the play-in. Of course, they're going to have home court advantage throughout the play-in tournament. And for me, although I don't love it, I'm going to put the Denver Nuggets here as the seven seed. And I know people are going to be like, whoa, what is this guy smoking? You know, what I'm smoking here is the fact that Nikola Jokic, despite all the advanced analytics, he's not a good defensive center. I don't care how many times he tips a pass down there. Other players shoot around 70% at the rim when he's the one contesting. If you compare that to the best rim protectors in the league, that's about a 15% drop off. That is brutally bad. And I still think that the Nuggets will have issues against some of these other teams who can really pick on them in the pick and roll. Nikola Jokic, despite his improvement defensively, he's still not good out in space. And I think the Nuggets, they're just a little bit more limited. Jamal Murray's going to be playing basketball for the first time in about a year and a half. Michael Porter Jr., who really knows what we're getting from them. They have some new additions. I really do like Bruce Brown and Contavious Caldwell Pope there. I think those were two good targeted gets for them that fit their roster. This is a good team. This is a very good team. But again, tough West. I think I have to have them seven. I don't love that. I really don't. But I think when you compare them to some of the other teams, it makes some sense for where they're currently at. Especially, you know, Nikola Jokic played his mind out last year and this team was, you know, around a seven seed. Yes, they should be healthier this year, but will Nikola Jokic have a better season than he just had? Probably not. Moving into the sixth seed now, and I think there's two teams I really want to consider here, and I think it's going to be the Phoenix Suns, and I know people are going to be surprised by that as well. They were the one seed last year in the West, won 64 games, really talented team, a lot of good players. I don't like the fact that they're trading Jay Crowder. I think that they're going to really miss him from their rotation. Even if he's not a great player, he's a very reliable player at the forward spot. And also, DeAndre Ayton really does not sound thrilled to be in Phoenix. They have this whole issue with Robert Sarver looming over their head. Monty Williams has some drama with DeAndre Ayton. And a loss like they had against the Dallas Mavericks in Game 7 last year is one of those losses that you could really consider crippling to a franchise. Teams do not lose like that, especially in a playoff game game seven at home you just barely ever see that i can't remember a single time that i saw a game like that game seven at home for a team to get to the western conference finals i just i just don't even know if that's ever happened phoenix went out and quite frankly they played terribly uh there's no other words for it well there are but i'm not going to say them in this youtube video phoenix was really bad in that game seven and i think it's something that could have a lingering effect they were really great last year. Again, it does not feel right having them as a six seed, but this West is really loaded and I like the talent that they have. Memphis here is my five. And I know people are gonna say, whoa, he's got the Mavericks in the top four. Yeah, we'll get to them in a second. The Memphis Grizzlies here at five, I think that they're due for a little bit of a step back. They lost Kyle Anderson, which I think is a big loss for them during the regular season. No one ever really knows the health of Jaron Jackson Jr. He's a really great player when he plays especially for the regular season, but you know, his knee feet, he's been having a ton of injury issues. And yes, you could say, well, that team won, you know, so many games with John Morano last year, they'll have him this year. That was kind of an anomaly, right? That's not something you can really rely on year in, year out. I think they overpaid Tyus Jones. I like that they have the group together still, but Dylan Brooks is heading into a point where he's extension eligible, probably won't get an extension, which could create a little bit of drama there. And also Zaire Williams, are we going to see an uptick for him? And I think also they're going to try and supplement those Kyle Anderson minutes with David Roddy and also um, their other draft pick, Jake LaRavia out of Wake Forest. I like those two players individually, but again, those are rookies. They're not going to give you what Kyle Anderson gave you last year. And I think they are going to miss him a little bit. Slow-mo is one of those unique players who 
plays at his own pace, plays very differently than most wings in the NBA. And that was one of the toughest things for other teams to counter on the Grizzlies week or night in, night out throughout the regular season. They just have this like different pace to them. Now I think Brandon Clark, if they lean into his minutes more in Jaron Jackson's absence, they can survive it. That's why I still have them as a, as a five seed. They're, they're a team that could win 50 plus games. That's how strong this West is. I think these teams down here, 13 through 15, probably lose 60-ish games almost, which is going to lead to a lot of high win amounts here in the top five or six. So again, I could look at Phoenix winning 48 games. It reminds me of the West about 13, 14 years ago when you know the eighth seed won 48 games one year. That's what we could be looking at again here this season, which is absolutely insane. The four seed now, I'm going to go ahead and do the Dallas Mavericks here as the four seed. And the reason why is they have the best offensive player in all of basketball. And if you're mad, don't at me. I don't really care what you think. Luka Doncic is much better offensively than pretty much everyone in the world. When you look at it from a real X's and O's perspective, he's the player you have the ball in his hands. They have adequate role players around him pretty much in every element. They added a 2010 guy in Christian Wood who they're going to bring off the bench early in the season. Not really like he's going to come off the bench, so he's going to play 30 minutes a game. Basically a starting role, just coming off the bench, doing it. And they have actual size. They can rebound the basketball now, finally. And yes, they lost Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson averaged about 16 points a game in the regular season. And this team won about 50 games still last year with Luka Doncic not really being in shape until January. And once they once he was in shape, they had the second best record in the second half of the season after the All-Star break, only behind the Boston Celtics, who lit the world on fire. This Mavericks team is way better than everyone else is expecting. Luka Doncic is better than everyone else talks about, even though he gets a ton of notoriety. Nobody can guard him. Nobody can stop him from passing the basketball. He has the widest range of passing angles in the league. The only guy you could argue is Nikola Jokic. And Nikola Jokic plays the game at a snail's pace. Luka Doncic plays with a live dribble. There's a huge difference between those two players in the half court. If you gave Luka Doncic post-up opportunities to hit cutters, he would do that just as well as Nikola Jokic does. I know that's going to be a hot take. I don't really care again. You can have your own opinions, but I'm telling you, Luka Doncic, offensively, he's so good. He's in shape, played Euro basket for Slovenia, looked really good doing it. And he didn't record his first dunk last year until the new year. I guarantee you he has a dunk within the first two weeks of the season. Now, I know that sounds like not a big deal. Trust me, it is for his conditioning and the shape that he's in. The Mavericks are built off of Luka Doncic, and he's ready for this year. I think he could win the MVP. Now moving into the three seed here, and we're going to go ahead with the Los Angeles Clippers here as the number three seed in the Western Conference, and they're a very good team as well. Probably the deepest team in the NBA. When you look at their 10-11 man rotation, you've got a ton of options in there. John Wall, Reggie Jackson at point guard. At the two, you can look at guys like Luke Kennard, Norm Powell. You have also Terrence Mann in there. At the three, you've got you know Marcus Morris. You've got Nicholas Batum. You've got Kawhi Leonard, Paul George. You've also got a, a collection of other players as well that can make a lot of meaningful plays. Amir Coffey, one of the more underrated players in the league. I was really glad to see them keep him around. Uh, and they also have Avica Zubats. They have Robert Covington now, who I thought was a steal in that Norm Powell trade as well. The Clippers are deep. They're talented. Kawhi Leonard's healthy. Paul George is healthy. Both of those two are rested. They'll probably put both play 60 games, but this is a team last year that won 40 plus games without either of them, essentially. Kawhi missed the entire season. Paul George missed 51 games, and that team still won over half of their games. Now you're adding two stars back into the mix. They are a lock to me for a top four seed, and I feel like the third spot is exactly where you'd want to see them fall. Now for me, the number two team in the West. And we are going to go, remember, this is on seeding. This is not a power rankings. This is not how I think the playoffs are going to play out. I'm going to put the Golden State Warriors second. They're a team that's not as concerned with the regular season as everybody else. I would say the Clippers and the Warriors kind of fall in the same boat where they're not really worried about their seeding or their positioning come playoff time. Now, this is a good reason why, two, that they should be worried about it. The Warriors would have to play the Clippers in the second round of the playoffs if this were the matchups, which seems like a nightmare for these two organizations. That seems like a bloodbath. But the Warriors... They have Draymond Green, they have Steph Curry, they have Klay Thompson, they have Jordan Poole. They have young guys who are going to get a little bit more run this year, which is why I'm opting against them for the one seed. But they are going to be awesome. Again, probably my favorites to win the NBA Finals, them were the Los Angeles Clippers. But those two teams are really legit. And you can see here, my final team that I'm putting into the rankings here as the one seed, and I know people are going to think this is a really hot take, I don't really care, is the Minnesota Timberwolves. 
And people are going to say, whoa, what? The Timberwolves? Here's a stat for you. The last five years, the Utah Jazz have won the most games in the NBA. And it's no mistake that they went from the best team in those five years in terms of regular season record to what is going to be the worst team in the league this year after trading Rudy Gobert. I know everyone else is going to say, oh, Donovan Mitchell this, Donovan... There's a reason Rudy Gobert is a three-time defensive player of the year and has the highest offensive rating in the history of the NBA. The reason for that, he sets amazing screens, he rebounds the heck out of the basketball, and he gets second chance opportunities. He's someone who's a great lob threat, and he's such a perfect auxiliary piece in Minnesota. He's going to make D'Angelo Russell way better. Think about when D'Angelo Russell was an all-star with the Brooklyn Nets. He had Jared Allen as a consistent dive man, rolling to the rim on every single pick and roll. He finally has that again, but it's a bigger, better version of it in Rudy Gobert. He is one of the best rollers I've ever seen. He is the best screen setter in the entire NBA. I firmly believe that. He leads the league in screen assists essentially every year. And for Chris Finch's offense, running that double drag screen at the top of the key, that has been a fixture in Minnesota since they hired Chris Finch. And that's not going anywhere. In fact, it got way better. Carl Anthony Towns playing the four. I really like this for the regular season. Again, I don't think the Timberwolves are the actual best team in the West, but this team is hungry. They are deep. They are talented. They added Kyle Anderson. And Anthony Edwards heading into year three of his career, I think is going to take a massive leap forward. We're talking all-star type of player going into year three. We saw John Morant make a very similar jump. Now, I don't think he's going to be quite as good as John Morant was in year three. But again, I think we're seeing a huge jump we're going to see Anthony Edwards guard on ball a lot more. Jaden McDaniels is going to take a step forward. And this team added a lot of other good bets. Bryn Forbes, Austin Rivers, Kyle Anderson, who I already mentioned. I think Nas Reed is a really good backup big for this situation. We're probably going to see Chris Finch tie the minutes of Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns together. And also the minutes of Rudy Gobert with D'Angelo Russell. And I think those are perfect pairings. If he doesn't do that, I'd be very, very surprised. But this is my Western Conference standings by the end of the year. Let me know what you disagree with. Obviously, this is for the regular season, not necessarily the teams I see as the best when it comes postseason time. But again, just to recap, 15 Utah, 14 the Houston Rockets, 13 the San Antonio Spurs, at 12 the Oklahoma City Thunder, 11 we have the Sacramento Kings, at 10 the Portland Trailblazers, 9 the Los Angeles Lakers, 8 Pelicans, 7 Nuggets, 6 Suns, that's kind of a hot take. Five, the Memphis Grizzlies. Four, the Dallas Mavericks. Three, the Los Angeles Clippers. Two, the Golden State Warriors for the regular season. And one, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Someone take a screenshot because if I'm right, I want this on Twitter later. If I'm wrong, you can put it on Twitter later. I'll own up to it. It's all right. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you did enjoy the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more. And we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.